just double checking. I got uh, this going. Okay, and I hit the record. Awesome. Cool. All right. Hey, thank you for the sub. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And it's time for an exclusive interview. Today, we're going to be having a conversation with singer, songwriter, author as well, Michelle Zahner, a.k.a. Japanese Breakfast, whose new record, uh, <clears throat> Jubilee, has just dropped. Gave it a review recently. Enjoyed it. You guys are enjoying it quite a bit as well. And we're hoping to uh, talk with her about that LP, her new book, and anything else that comes up in between. Uh, Michelle... Uh, Excuse me, Michelle, thank you for coming through. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I mixed your first name and last name there for, yeah, for no. a second. <laughs> the the CH and the Z, I just melded them for some reason. I, I have That's no cool. idea why. Sounds like a like a fancy soap or something. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um let's start with uh the new LP. It's out. Do you feel like at this point this is like a weight off your shoulders now and, and now you're really kind of able to uh, observe the album in the world and kind of see it for what it is as opposed to kind of like the vacuum of your you know own experience kind of creating it and crafting it? Yes. Mm. <laughs> um, I feel like uh, I maybe need like one more week to like run away from it. Like mm. I feel like I'm entering this place where – like these two huge projects I've worked on for the past four years uh, are out in the world. And I like, to be honest, I've just obsessively been reading like every, every comment about <laughs> like what people think of it. And I'm like, it's dwindling down and like the press is chilling out. And yesterday I just like sat on my balcony and like read a book for the first time in like a while. Uh, and it was such a lovely experience and I am in that place that I actually really love the most as an artist where I'm like kind of hollow and like I'm filling back up um and finding what interests me to like tackle whatever new project is ahead hmm. so I mean I'm, I'm slowly entering like that good good spot and leaving like toxic space of uh, obsessively checking what everyone is saying about it. I feel like that's like kind of coming to an end, which is nice. Yeah, that, that was actually one of my um, my questions that I wanted to get into and, and not to, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, make some sort of creepy observation here or anything, because this, this is uh, something I think is true of myself and other musicians as well, and I think is increasingly becoming the case as uh, uh, time goes on. But, uh, you know, from what I see, you strike me as someone who's very online, generally God, and no. <laughs> <laughs> but um i don't want to give that impression at all i need but, to ex <laughs> but with that do, do you find yourself in a place where you you do kind of struggle to not put your hand in the cookie jar and just like oh you know conti continuously like feed yourself negativity or positivity you know re regardless of what the feedback is yeah big time mm -hmm. i wish i was like a better person and more mature uh and could walk away from it because when i have I have really nice days like yesterday where I just like deleted Twitter and like enjoy it. And the mm. second I go back on there, it's like you see like one one little thing out of many nice things. And it's just like all you can think. And why? Like it's just some nerd. Uh, <laughs> <in this Aquarian. laughs> uh, no, I mean, like I it, it's like such an it's like it's so weird because I, I think about it. The Internet kind of like if you could hear everyone's thoughts like on a plane or maybe maybe I've read this, like maybe Gia Tol Tolentino has like written about this. Hmm. But um, I feel like it's yeah, like I feel like someone someone smarter than me has talked about this before, where uh, the Internet is kind of like knowing what everyone's thinking on a plane. And like you're not supposed to know that. Uh, and it's not even helpful. And it's not even like fully what people think. They just like are going off into the void. And uh, it's really hard. It's like such a Pandora's box to like not know, you know, to to not. <laughs> Sorry, it's just such a bender. But it's hard not to open and 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 learn what what people are saying about you. And I think also, you know, to be quite honest, like I've been in this industry for a long time, and it's it always feels like a real miracle to me. Like I've won the lottery. I like have the dream the dream job, and I'm constantly like sniffing out like, okay, who's gonna end it? Like who's like what's gonna happen to it? And and I think part of like searching online for that is kind of like you're looking for that trapdoor of like what people are saying. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something 
it's something new as you get bigger, I guess, that you just like have to learn how to walk away from. It's tough. Yeah. How do you survive? I mean, like, I, mean I, really? I was, uh, you know, I, I am not entirely sure sometimes because like your observation, it seems like it be now with the internet becoming famous is like winning the lottery and uh, you can put a lot of effort into it. But uh, you know, in, in my mind, that's sort of like buying the ticket. And uh, once you bought the ticket, if you're chosen for whatever reason, um, from that point, as you sort of observed, uh, no matter what your medium is or what content you're creating, I know it's horrible to think of everything like just content, but that's kind of where we're moving, unfortunately. Um, it, it seems like it can just end out of nowhere for whatever reason. And there's almost like no explanation as to why. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm trying to be as like consistent and just I'm always constantly on the hamster wheel. And <laughs> I don't know totally. if you feel a similar way, but oh, like yeah. I, I, I feel like that's really the only way that you can just be in it to win it. You've just got to constantly be paddling and just keeping your head above water because, you know, we're not in a place and we're not in a state where you can kind of like take a super long break for ever and be completely, completely like disconnected and have your audience waiting there for you all the time. You know, not only because people sort of move on to other things, but it seems like the 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 span of ages at which you know like people kind of get into things uh, changes so rapidly too you know it's like if if you're taking a break for 2 to 3 years you're missing out on like you know a whole new generation of like teens and tweens that could be getting into your film your art your illustrations and lord knows people who are my age and older are too fucking jaded to get into anything that's not like you know thrown into their laps on Netflix you know mm. well for you it's like also way worse because I feel like I can't imagine like having to generate content like at the level that you have to I mean like you make videos at least like once a week more than that uh, way way more than than that we're we're, yeah. ma we're making tomorrow's video right now Michelle we're yeah, making tomorrow's video right now <laughs> is it daily it's daily oh yeah it is absolutely daily yeah that's yeah. why it you know it's I feel like it there's kind of almost like an assembly line type experience to it and once you've and, and I have a team of people who I work with you know so it's like once you've kind of gotten to that point and you're used to I guess kind of the routine of it and you have other people that you're working with you kind of hit a stride I guess you know yeah yeah um but you know speaking of output and creativity and you know kind of this new generation of artists and creators I, I feel like in your own way you're a reflection of that because increasingly I see more people out there making stuff, selling stuff, streaming stuff. And they're almost like in a way like a jack of all trades because you have your album, you have your TikTok presence, you have your book or your clothing line or something. It seems almost like, you know, no matter what your creative medium is, you can go out there and take advantage of it, you know, reg regardless of kind of a, you know, a, a, what your skill set might be. Uh, yes. <laughs> I feel like, um, yeah, for me, like, I feel like I am always also just like running, but like, it, I feel like everything I do is like pretty authentically rooted in my interests. Like, I'm definitely actively not trying to find more things to get into. I already feel like it's, it's enough. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does seem like quite a bit. I was actually going to ask if you uh, <laughs> had ambitions to take on another medium or another hobby or something, especially considering a uh, th this video game soundtrack that you're uh, tied in with recently that's going to be coming out at some point. Yeah, I think I just kind of want to keep getting better at the, at the <clears throat> stuff I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, that's quite where I'm at. And, you know, for you in uh, in general, was this kind of, I guess, uh, uh, the goal with Jubilee, <laughs> just like advancing to, you know, past what you had done on, uh, on past efforts? I mean, it certainly seems like... Uh, that might have been uh, the goal in some sense, especially with like all the grand orchestrations you've worked into this record and just how uh, ambitious the instrumental palette is this time around. Yeah, I feel like I I have I was like very petrified of the sophomore slump. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've been playing in bands for almost 10 years and it was just not happening for me. And then when my mom passed away, I was 25 and I was like, you know, I've been doing this like DIY thing for a really long time. If it hasn't happened to me now, it's never going to happen to me. Uh, and so then I went and got a nine to five job. Um, but I was also like after work, like mixing this record, um, Psychopomp. And I had written this essay that ended up kind of turning into crying in H Mart. Mm -hmm. And of course, like of all 
you know, it, I had no ambition for it. There was like a small uh, record label out of Frostburg, Maryland called Yellow K Records. They were the only ones who wanted to put it out. Even my friend's labels like didn't want to put out that record. And like I asked Double Double Whammy to put out the record and they're like, I'm really sorry, Michelle, we're like too, too busy. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Uh, and so, yeah, Yellow K put it out and they were like, I, I told them explicitly, like, I'm not going to tour. I have this job. I have health insurance. Like, I got to see about that for a while. And uh, they're like, cool, we're going to we're going to get a PR person to work on it. And we're like, <laughs> it's like, OK, it's your money. It's a waste. And then that record did really well. And I went to South by and I, I signed to Dead Oceans. I got a booking agent, like all the like classic stuff that happens at South by and like a dream scenario happened to me at that. And I just had it only took like completely giving up on any idea of like, you know, uh, ambitions for a music career to finally have it sort of fall into my lap. So after that happened, I was like convinced that Psychopomp was just this complete fluke. And I was going to like bungle what I had just like finally gotten into my hands. And the only way I could like really feel like I could combat that was like to work in the super insular environment and basically like a step up from a bedroom studio um, with one other collaborator, Craig Hendricks, who co-produced the album. And together we just, uh, you know, like, played and like had fun and like tried to like make an, a good authentic like environment uh and not be pandering to anything but like my own interests and, and the two of us arranged it and, and played on the instruments for the third record i feel like you know i'd been touring for the last three years and i feel like i've become such a better composer and, and producer in general and i just like wanted to push myself and it felt like a, a lot of third albums for other artists that i really admire like Bjork or Wilco or Beach House or Kate Bush like I, I I mean I guess Kate Bush is always killing it but like I feel like the third album is like when you, when you really understand who you are and what you have to offer as a musician and like what makes you unique um, and it should just feel really confident and bombastic so I, I was just kind of trying to do that hmm. <laughs> and do you do- do you feel like you got close to that? Because, I mean, you know, just to make an observation about the record, it is a very versatile record, you know. Uh, it's it's uh, got a lot of great tracks on it, but as far as, like, styles and sounds and instrumental palettes, it's almost like a Swiss Army knife in a way. You know, you, you try and succeed at so many different, you know, kind of uh, vibes throughout the LP, from the grand horn openings to, you know, almost like that sunshine pop vibe of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Kokomo track. Yeah, I will say I think that's something I've kind of always done with Japanese Breakfast. And I think part of that comes from letting it be letting it start as a studio project in a way. Like when I was in Little Big League, my old band was kind of like this like emo punk band. You know, it was all about let's write the song as a band and go into the studio and try to like create that live vibe uh, and bring it to life on record. When Japanese Breakfast happened, it was it was very much like on a song by song basis. We went into the studio with a song and then did everything to serve the song in terms of like the production arrangement. There was no limitation because I had no ambition to perform it live. I was just like, I want to I want to do I want to give whatever the song needs to like make it be what it wants to be. And I feel like with my like with Psychopomp and, and Soft Sounds, like Soft Sounds, you have songs like Till Death and Boyish that kind of have this sort of like classic uh, sort of like Ronettes, like Phil Spector, sort of like classic sounding vibe. But then you have a song like Machinist with uh, auto tune and then you have a song like Diving Woman that's more of like a shoegaze jam. And I think that it, it comes from just like wanting to serve the song and doing and, and chasing whatever that particular song needs without thinking of like, OK, what makes this cohesive beyond like you are the director and helming this project. That's like what makes it cohesive to me. Hmm. I uh, want to dive into some of the, um, uh, you know, lyrical themes of the record, uh, you know, almost jumping off of what we were talking about earlier, um, you know, in regards to like online perceptions and people, uh, you know, getting to you, getting to me, getting to anybody uh, in, in the online space. Um, you know, considering, uh, uh, you know, that concern, uh, does it ever kind of cross your mind, uh, you know, even with uh, music or uh, uh, your book that you recently released? Um, you know, is, is, is there a point at which you're kind of crossing a line and getting too personal or kind of giving away too much because you're afraid of how that might manifest itself in somebody else's kind of perception, you know, to... Uh, as you were saying, kind of with the internet thing, uh, it's like everybody knows everybody's thought, 
but kind of the also, you know, the double edged sword of that. The other worst thing about it is there's no context for any of those thoughts either. <laughs> so it's like, right. you know, things can be taken totally out of, you know, uh, the, the, the background that they're in and sort of be interpreted in like the worst way. Yeah, that's horrifying. Um, I think it's a lot scarier in, in writing pro honestly, than it is with songwriting because it's mm. just so impressionistic that like it would be in po like poetry, like it's impossible for someone. It's, it's always like fascinating to me when someone's like, it's clearly about this and it's like so off base and that's just, you know, the nature of the medium. Whereas like with prose, with writing a book like you really have to guide someone along and make them feel exactly what you want them to feel and make them know exactly what you want them to know but um yeah I mean I try not to think about it honestly because like you, it's sort of out of your control like you can I mean I certainly do think about it but every time I do I try to sort of stray away from it I mean there's certain fun parts of like fandom or like thinking about other people that that um know of your canon that's like kind of like a private nod that's like more interesting to me like <clears throat> like you know there's part of me that was like oh I was like wondering if people were going to complain about the lack of guitars on this record or there's like just less guitars and so I was like well you know then there'll be a three minute fucking solo at the end there's gonna be good harmonies on Savage Good Boy I'll give him a guitar um and so and also just like fucking with like people's perception or just like expectation like I, I also was like oh everyone's gonna expect me to like try to make like mass appeal like pop music to like get into arenas or something I'm gonna give I'm gonna like not do that like I could have very easily like on like this strictly electronic like pop like oriented route but I was like haha I'll go this way and like kind of try to make something like a little bit more bizarre and idiosyncratic and yeah, I mean, I, to a certain extent, though, like lyrically, I don't I don't you know, it's it's like appalling what some people have thought some lyrics are about. And and to a certain extent, like you can't control that. I mean, I remember like very famously, like the dude from like Say Anything thought that like was talking about how like rape me was like uh, like a rape cultural <laughs> anthem or something like that. And like that's like, you know, there's all sorts of I was like I, I did an interview with Liz Fair recently and she was also talking about how like a lot of music industry people were like, oh, you're like you're really down with sex because you like sing about it and like no it's like a commentary on that and it you know there's there's a certain extent like you, there's so many stupid people in the world that like you can't really control like what they're going to interpret a song to be and sometimes they interpret it in your favor where they they find like a greater depth or a more interesting interpretation of a song that uh is like maybe even better than what <laughs> you came up with you know hmm. I, I i found the lyrics on a um the opener to be especially stunning and and maybe even a bit meta uh if you could maybe dive into that a little bit it seemed uh at least from my own perception a moment of being kind of uh maybe enamored with the position that you're in as as a creator is 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 that true or am i misreading that no sir i, I certainly think so it's very much a thesis statement for that album and i i think you know to bring back up what you were talking about earlier where it's like, sort of sometimes like as a musician it just feels like you're you're similar to you like it feels like you're on a hamster wheel you're just like running so fast to try to catch up and like take advantage of every opportunity and sometimes you just like forget to like look around you know because you're just so focused on like running and like looking at the ground to like you know be as tight as you can in rehearsals and like take every show and like you know do every interview because like you have this opportunity to go 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 that I I sometimes just forget to just like you know, look around and, and enjoy it, you know, and especially like after, I mean, I, I wrote this like before the pandemic, but like, especially during the pandemic, it made me realize like, you know, I have to make sure to like, enjoy the thing, you know, cause it's gonna, it's gonna end someday. And like, uh, it's a, just a, you know, it, it fit like the theme so well, of just like, that's, that's my personal struggle with like reminding myself to like experience joy sometimes. Cause I, I'm just so busy trying to like, do my best and like run and get it uh that I sometimes like forget to like stop and look around and just be like you're playing a show in Central Park right now you're like playing this huge venue and like people are singing along to your songs like that's what you always wanted that's amazing hmm. I, I you know thinking about what you're describing here um you know a part of this whole thing is is really just um I, I guess your your knack and your ability uh which I you know I think we're seeing 
uh, in this recent album cycle to, I guess, have, uh, you know, numerous irons in the fire and being juggling things, uh, you know, specifically in regards to the, to the release of this record and the book that you just put out as well, which I, I know that uh, you weren't necessarily planning on the album to come out after the book. But, uh, you know, considering like the span of time, the life experiences that inspired both of these things and, and also... Um, in, in a way, almost like the contrasting feelings that kind of inform both of these works. Uh, I wanted to know, it, in, from your own personal perspective, how much do these two things kind of, you know, intersect thematically and emotionally for you? I mean, was one kind of inspiring the other or, you know, the experiences that kind of inform one, do they also inform the other? Or in your own mind over this course of time, were both kind of compartment, compartmentalized, you know, considering how much Jubilee is about joy, but then crying at H Mart is, is about, you know, a lot of like personal experiences and struggles and your mother and your heritage and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think like <clears throat> I don't know if I would have felt this way if the record didn't get pushed, but in, in a in a in a way. So the record was supposed to come out before the book. It was supposed to yeah. come out in summer of twenty twenty. Um, but I, I think it actually ended up being better this way. Um, uh, because I think in a way I I said everything that I needed to say about grief and loss and that experience um that i couldn't say in two records because there's just not enough space you know like you and like uh, people who've read the book who are who who are fans of johnny's breakfast might recognize that there are a lot of borrowed lines because like there are perfect lines that encompass uh, uh encompass like f certain feelings but i never get to actually show the real scene so like there's a line on rugged country that's like about a heavy hand where, where your death is a wedding ring, which is about my dad taking my mom's wedding ring after she died and putting it on my finger and how like heavy physically it felt, but also, you know, emotionally, obviously. Um, and, you know, you just get that line. It could mean many things. Uh, and I'm sure not a lot of people imagine that that's like the scene that that comes from. But then, you know, it felt important to me to to actually show that scene and dive into that scene. So I feel like in a way, like the book really made me feel like I, I had finally said everything I needed to say about this part of my life that has just like haunted me and been like such an enormous part of like my psyche for the last six years. And obviously, like grief is something that lives on with you. But in a way, I felt like ready to explore a new part of the human experience. You know, I felt really like, you know, I had said everything I needed to say about that. Like, it's time to move on. And the most unexpected thing that I could do and like the sort of other opposite end of the spectrum was to write, an, you know, a ha <laughs> an album about joy, you know, and I also think that it's such a it's not a common thing for like an indie rocker to like uh, you indie rocker. Uh, but like it's not a it's not a normal thing for like an indie artist to um, write an album <laughs> about joy, you know, uh, we're like sort of expected to be like sad sacks all the time. You know, that's that's true. I feel like the extent to which you can get close to that is if you can write really good beachy wavy sort of I never, I never, music, yeah, which I never. yeah i mean ob ob obviously but you know yeah. just just to sort of like jump off of your comment there you know it's like the closest thing that you can get to legitimate like hey we're feeling good here is, is something that you can kind of vibe to at the festival yeah well i'm like on the east coast so that, that doesn't exist over here <laughs> <laughs> um uh, before we get a little deeper into the music, I wanted to ask you, now that this book is out and it's seen the success that it has, um, and, you know, you've sort of, like, gone through this intense period of writing about your own personal life and experiences, like, what are your writing ambitions past this point? Considering it's it's something that you have obviously studied and done for so long, um, is it uh, down the road in your mind more nonfiction or something in kind of another uh, lane? I think that both in music and um, in writing books <laughs> i i'm more interested in in sort of departing or like leaving behind this very like hyper vulnerable personal um unpacking mm. i i really i see myself headed in more of a like technical crafty direction um in in both of my writing i think that's what it, it is calling to me now mm -hmm. and in technical meaning is is that something that you're talking about from a writing perspective or like a compositional perspective? Both. So for writing, like my, I, I I don't know if it's like a bad thing that I've like revealed this thing that's like definitely not going to exist for a long time. But I would really love to write an, a book 
about language um, and just like incorporate more sort of like data about like the brain and, and how we learn um, new things and uh, and also, you know, incorporated into nonfiction. So specifically, like I would love to spend a year uh, living in Korea and documenting the experience of learning a language and becoming fluent and and doing a lot a lot more like research that's not my own personal history that's like rooted in like you know uh i don't know like other texts uh and and sort of explore like how how the brain processes information and uh the process of of learning a language and and linguistics in general Mm -hmm. musically uh i am more interested in like pushing my craft and like having it be rooted like less in like this personal narrative and more in like constructing like um i don't know i guess like just smarter songs Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of language, from what I understand, the new book is going to be translated into Korean as well. There's going to be like a Korean version of the book. Um, are you anticipating with the release of that for there to be a much different reception than you may be getting from like, you know, Western audiences? Yeah, I have no idea. It must be really weird. Um, it's very nerve wracking. I, I can see it both going both ways. I can see it being um, something like I, a Korean people, like a lot of people are like very, very proud. And um, I think that it's a touching story about and that. I think that a lot of Korean people might be curious about like what it's like to be mixed race in America and, and to like relate to Korean culture in this way. It seems like something they could be interested in. But I also worry that it's like, uh, I don't know, like what the American equivalent would be, but it's like to have these like really rich descriptions of like meatloaf or something like if, if they if like uh, it won't ring like this, like why is she going on about this thing that we like eat like if i was like and then the scrambled eggs were like you know <laughs> like whatever like i don't know if if like it'll hit the same way like that this like appreciation of certain types of food that are like you know more normal over there I, i'm not i'm not sure i'm it's nerve-wracking hmm. uh, uh, culturally speaking considering i guess um maybe some of like the old world perceptions of uh, things like privacy or yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I want to say a, a tradition or, you know, expectations for, you know, how your adult children should grow up and carry themselves and what kinds of, you know, uh, lives they should lead, you know, uh, as they transition into adulthood. Um, are there any sort of like taboos on that front that you feel like the book, you know, may rub some people the wrong way on, you know, in, in, in terms of a, you know, how you, how you go into those themes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that <clears throat> at least like from what I know about my family and, and my mom, like, I, I feel like there is, uh, a real, you know, um, yeah, like it's not like a, my, my family's like not into like oversharing, you know, or like, it's a very private culture, uh, from what I have experienced. And, um, yeah, I'm definitely worried about it because there's a lot of like, kind of like gruesome stuff in there like very like grotesque like body horror at times and uh i have no idea how how um that will be perceived Hmm. um yeah we'll we'll find out it's a a new thing for me to be nervous about but at least like i can't read the comments over there so i won't really know (laughs) um i i'm not exactly sure how to um I guess, pose this next observation as a a question because it's something that I don't experience personally. But, um, you know, I I guess uh, in your own mind, like what is your own philosophy when it comes to, I guess, trying to balance these senses of, um, you know, I'm an American and I don't want to be othered. I want to be, you know, seen as a person just like anyone else. But yet I also want to in my own mind, value my heritage and my identity, which there's, you know, sort of background and a set of expectations that come with that. But then on top of that, I also want to be seen as an individual with very specific interests and, you know, pursuits and successes and things that I chase after personally. And, you know, as, as you kind of move through life, like in, in what way do these things kind of take priority? You know, like which, which ones, you know, do you focus on? And when you're kind of thinking about one too much, do you feel like it's kind of being sacrificed at the hand of another or so on and so forth? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, You know, it's tough. Like there is definitely a part of me, especially as a musician that wants to be like, don't fucking talk to me about that. You know, it's like, it's not like I use, 
I think I like shot myself in the foot a little bit. Like I named the band Jamie's Breakfast. I came out with a, a book about my cultural experiences. And, you know, I just never thought, <clears throat> I don't know. I think it, I think it's going to be ever changing because like, um, I don't know, there's part of me that's like kind of grossed out by it because like I do want to, I don't want to be like South Korean American, mm. like female artist, blah, blah, blah. I just like want to be the artist, you know? And like, I remember even like earlier, like, you know, we were talking to um, some like big tech companies <laughs> that were like, we want to give you this billboard for like AAPI month. And like, can you do these interviews for like AAPI month where you like talk to your like um, Korean family? And like, you know, I, I was just like, why do I have to do that? Why can't I, can, why can't you just put me on a billboard? You know what I mean? Like, why does, why does I like, only have to be like this? I'm like segregated to like this month. And like, I, I don't, I don't want to, I just like want to be, looked at as like an artist like why can't if you wanted to like have diversity in your campaign like why can't you just treat me the same way that like out not in april you know um sure. so yeah i mean it's tough and it was like it was like a scary thing for me to walk away from and i think that's just like kind of a new thing where like i am in the position now where it's like easier to be like choosy about what i do because i'm not just like saying yes to everything and like paralyzed by saying like no to certain things um but yeah, I mean, it's tough because like it's so, so, you know, I mean, it's but it's mostly in music, like with the book, like and, and my, myself as like a person, like obviously like that's that's a big part of my work. But as a musician, like I don't I don't really think it is, you know, I don't use like traditional Asian instruments like I don't really, you know, I don't know. There's part of me that like wants to play with it because it's like a fun thing. Um, and it's also like so many like white musicians have like used asian culture in general to like just as like a cool motif that's kind of just like well what if i just did that because like i'm actually like you know like i actually have a relationship to this stuff um but yeah i don't know it's hard it's like it's different every day to me honestly <laughs> yeah no i i appreciate you uh going into it and you know sort of explaining that and and also uh choosing to do this interview with <laughs> With all of your other obligations as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I was definitely really scared. It's scarier like that there's like this blot, there's like a curtain behind like what's going on over there. I'm so well, over, scared. Over, what, like, over here? Yeah, over there. And then like also like on, I just like YouTube is so scary. Like the, your community and the YouTube community in general. Ugh, I, as, as far as I know, everyone's behaving really well in the Twitch chat right now. And uh, they're doing a good job. They're doing a good job. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, YouTube's a pretty freaky place, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you've caught weird comments on your own music videos that you've uh, put up over there, and um, and yeah, it's 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 a weird freaking beast. And the longer I'm on it, the more I feel like in it. In, and this is kind of another awful thing about it. That's you know a different topic, but I feel like it's becoming more and more almost like TV. You know, it's like the things that the algorithm shares just sort of seem like a little bit more corporate every year and i suppose it is what it is and i just sort of like wonder what independence is going to mean on youtube into the future i i don't know yeah. i really don't know but um <clears throat> to uh move on from there um to take it back a little bit to the video game soundtrack that we were talking about earlier um you know how deep are you personally since this is a question i got a few of uh, from the audience before we went live um you know how deep personally does like you know gaming as a medium sort of you know run from you run for you and and does that sort of like you know inspire any of the stuff that you're working on on a regular basis in any way yeah um i got really into video games when i was like 5 my dad and i had a super nintendo and specifically yes. Yeah, SNES. And yes. uh, there was this one game called Secret of Mana. Yes. Yeah, it's like a, it's yes. a game. Uh, and it's like one of the few RPGs that was two player. And so it was yes. like kind of the only thing that like my dad and I <laughs> were into doing together. It was like our only bonding time. And it's like kind of like a really like a cool thing to do like with someone else is like traverse like a world and mm -hmm. um it was kind of the first game that i played where i was like this is art like this is a narrative and like i love the characters and the art is amazing the music is amazing 
And it was like the first like real journey I like went on with my dad. And like when we finished it, it was just like such a like sense of like a we had like really done something together. Mm. And I just love that feeling. And then I got um, I got a PlayStation and uh, started getting into all of the Final Fantasy games and Chrono Cross and Legend of Mana, which I'm really excited. Is co- is, I think it's coming out um in a few days on on switch the remaster but i i just basically got really into like i also like just you know grew up like being really into anime so like all the games that like kind of looked like anime i was really into um and so yeah i i i kind of like was into like the old school rpgs but then i kind of fell off gaming besides like really nerdy like not cool games to be into besides like breath of the wild and um but yeah i mean like this game sable like definitely like is just one of those games that I think like like strikes in like a chord uh in me like I just it it feels like it just feels like one of those games that you can appreciate like the narrative and the art and and hopefully the music and uh it just feels like very elegant and I'm like really happy to be a part of it um but I don't know how much it influences game I don't know how much like games influence like my my music like Japanese breakfast music or Mm-hmm. And, no, I think we actually did sample something for Psychopomp, but I can't really remember what. And and this this game is a, an open world uh, as well, you know, sort of like an adventure style, from what I understand. Yeah, it's it's definitely yeah, it's an open world adventure game, and there's no combat, so it's just like you're it's like a coming of age story about this girl Sable who explores like this desert planet on her hover bike. Mm-hmm. This goddamn car alarm. Sorry, <laughs> we'll deal with it. <laughs> this but, person. Um, car alarm goes off like three days three times a day and then I, we've like scolded him before and he's been like how do you think i feel <laughs> just like you're waking up the block every day yeah yeah he got it okay <laughs> really good job making it about himself um yeah. but uh but yes i mean absolutely sick fucking game i mean every single time rpgs from that era come up uh i feel like that game doesn't come up enough i mean like even did you I, play that I, game you yeah. man I, I, I could go in the basement I get my cartridge I got the cartridge for it baby yeah. like yeah. It, like so many great aspects of the gameplay with that RPG in comparison with others like the way that you sort of like scroll through the uh you know attacks like the way that those come up it is a and, really good combination because it's like it there there are like um because like the combat it's like not turn based yeah yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very fun. quick and it's and, and even sort of like, like using Zelda powers is super like, cool. I don't know any any other I don't know why more RPGs like don't emulate that game because it's so special I feel like yeah no it's totally good in terms of just like the flow and the functionality and as you say it's sort of the two-player thing and just the music is totally sick like the battle music and like I remember I remember personally being like I can't remember what level it is but i think like when you first run into that thanos guy and sort of like that dark yeah. church and everything with yeah, like, yeah like Pend- the, in Pandora. Yeah, yeah like all the bell music and everything like that yeah, was seriously oh, yeah. dark shit that was seriously weird yeah, dark yeah. shit with those like weird floating guys that with the tomato yes yes <laughs> yeah yeah the, the, just really weird enemies too like but, the chess pieces yes uh, that were really hard to kill um yeah yeah that game is is so good i was so excited because they did like a remaster for it for like playstation 4 or something and mm. it was so bad mm. they like turned it into a kid's game it was really it was really disappointing i i downloaded um the, mm. the switch bundle pack where they had like all the snes ones like together and sort of like a couple uh, wait together. really yeah yeah they have like the oh, original what? secret of wait, mana really? yeah it's a it's it's like oh, a it's oh, like a bundle on, thing on, on the, but it's like on the like mini snes or it's on the switch yeah it's on the switch it's a, it's, oh, on, it's on it's it's on it's on the it's it's its own game it's sort of like the original secret of mana and then the sequel sort of packaged into one thing uh oh i think i got that too but oh, okay. I, I don't know i guess yeah maybe yeah. i need to reboot it <laughs> yeah but i i've i've been i played through the sequel a little bit i, I haven't finished it yet but whatever we're, we're we're getting too much into this video game. <laughs> um so uh uh to to get into some of the influences for for the record because uh uh one thing that kind of struck me about hey, can the I have, sorry to interview can i have a, a can i ask what the melon thing is yes yes you can ask me what the melon thing is where did that come from um i know it's like a thing but i don't know it is a why. thing it is a yeah. thing and we, and we embrace the thing 
and we have melon emotes over here in chat on Twitch. Okay. Um, like it, it's a melon? Yeah, it's like a literal melon. People are putting What up kind melon. of melon? Just like a, a watermelon? I prefer a watermelon. Or as far as, as far as my own identity goes, I identify more as a watermelon than I do okay. as sort of well, like I mean, a, it's definitely the best melon. Some people tell me some people say more of a honeydew or something like that, oh, but it's I, like I'm the melon. Yeah, I I feel I feel more of like a watermelon anyway. Um okay. but uh Basically, to go back to what we were talking about at the start of this interview, that everybody hates me and wishes I was <laughs> dead. Um, there was, I think, early on. It the, sound like I was threatening you, like before we came on this thing. <laughs> early on in the 2010s, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm sure you know, as a music fan yourself, you might be aware of the electronic music producer Zombie. No. Yes. No. That's that's fine. <laughs> it's totally cool. Well, anyway. Um, I hadn't reviewed the guy's music yet, but I, uh, was aware before I reviewed his music for the first time that he had a huge reputation for beefing with basically everybody, like from calling out other musicians on Twitter, calling out journalists, and even like getting into physical altercations with a few people. And I knew that the moment I reviewed his work, like he would tear me a new asshole on his Twitter feed, probably within 24 hours. And he did. And, uh, and and he just like went on this multi like 20 tweet rant or something. And he ended it all with uh, calling me a fucking melon. And so like basically my audience started just attacking him and shitting all over him. And he deleted the whole thread within like a few hours, which he usually does or, you know, used to do with his Twitter rants. Like he'd usually delete them pretty quickly anyway. And then after all of it was over, my fans just started endearingly calling me, you know, like a melon, you know, just like, hey, yeah, melon. That was pretty funny that that happened, you know, because at the end of all, everyone was like, why the fuck did you call him a melon? That's yeah, so weird. That's it doesn't make you. any sense. So yeah. uh, because in the context of his rant, it didn't really make any sense. He didn't point out a specific thing or say anything that would lead him to say that. It just sounded really wild, just like the whole yeah. rant. And that just sort of stuck around. But then as people sort of kept repeating it as a joke like new people would come in and see people saying it and I guess just kind of continue to follow suit, not really understanding the origin of it. So now it just kind of sticks okay. around. Now it's just the thing. Now it's just Got melon. It. Got it. Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, I've built a brand off of it. I've, I've even sold melon shirts. So I, I can't, I can't totally hate on the fact that it happened. So that with the watermelon, yeah, with like, like with, your head with, in a with, with my head, with like maybe a picture. You think it has to do with your head? Maybe. It might yeah. have to do with my head. But it was like a picture with like an image of maybe like, you know, two dozen different melons and then my head was in there, you know, implying that it's just one of many different types of melons. But um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about some of the influences musically on the new record. Thank you for asking, <laughs> though. Um <laughs> uh, because it, you know, if, if one thing struck me about the LP, it's that, you know, you, you seem like a, uh, not just a musician, but a serious music fan. And there were just like a lot of sounds and styles to me that reminded me of some of my favorite indie artists that I grew up with, uh, you know, grew up listening to from the nineties and the two thousands, be that like Bell and Sebastian or Bright Eyes or, um, uh, uh, even the, the opening track reminds me a little bit of Beirut. And I remember being kind of blown away by, Flying Club Cup when I, I was a, a lowly blogger, like in 2008 or so. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you personally, you know, as far as like your musical diet and musical, you know, experience goes, uh, uh, were, were those artists in those years kind of formative for you as, you know, kind of a, a, a listener? Absolutely. I don't think that I would willingly admit that those people, that those bands influenced this record. Mm. But I mean, that's certainly like, they they are they are what I grew up on and like likely in my subconscious of what great indie rock is made of. Mm. Um, but I feel like when <clears throat> I don't know, I think I think that like I typically have influences that are maybe a little bit further removed from like what I, or I try to like channel influences that are like uh, uh, maybe that feel cooler to me just because they're older. You know what I mean? Whereas I feel like those kinds of bands like there's not enough like distance of time uh, for me to feel like cool about those being like direct influences in a way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, but there are definitely bands that I like grew up loving and, and I'm sure influenced uh, the, the, you know, what, what I enjoy in music. 
mm-hmm. and want to recreate it in a way. But what some of the influences like, you know, Kate Bush, I was listening a lot of Kate Bush uh, when I when I made this record and a lot of Alex G. And, and I think <laughs> those are two very different musicians. But um, what I love about them is like, I think like I was interested in making like it's so weird to me that Kate Bush is an artist that has like massive appeal because she's so bizarre. Mm. Like her music is like proggy and super weird. Her voice is like really intense. Her lyrics are super surreal. And yet she's so beloved. Uh, and so there's like no, and Bjork too. Like they're, they're these artists that like, they don't sacrifice any um, part of their like idiosyncratic vision to like serve you up something with um, that like everyone's going to enjoy. And yet like, they're not like willfully making something that's like hard to listen to, if that makes sense. Hmm. So that was like kind of what I was trying to find for myself too. Or like Alex G is another example of just like one of my favorite contemporary songwriters and I think Alex writes pop music like but he made it's like so his own and it's like unlike you know anything that I've heard and yeah I, I, it's like it's it's like confrontational but it's also so listenable in a way so I was like kind of trying to find that for myself and then there were other influences that were you know more more basic I guess but um yeah you know, since, since we're just like kind of in in a way, just like throwing shit at a wall, talking about melons during this conversation, uh, let's let's uh, let let me do something crazy and ask you: Can you sell me on Alex G? Because oh. I've 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 I've, re- I've reviewed his music. I've reviewed yeah, his yeah. music. That's I'm not so I'm not crazy about it. You know, it's like I see yeah. the appeal and I see you know good things in it. But I'm gonna say like the closest thing I've had to somebody who's sort of like explaining the Alex G appeal to me is a drunken white college <laughs> student outside of a falafel truck at midnight uh, yeah. and that it, it didn't go well you know it it it, 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 it didn't go well so if, oh, if, if the person you, who is explaining i thought you were saying <clears throat> you think alex g sounds like a drunken no 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 i'm 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 <laughs> saying i'm telling you on it i'm saying yeah, yeah. i was literally uh, outside I of a I was, I was at a college campus right, right. at midnight and a drunk kid was trying to like pitch me on alex Let me g. Tell you about alex g yeah yeah um, and, it's, and it started like melon how come you don't like Alex G? And then, you know, yeah. the conversation went downhill from there. Um, but, you know, in, in this moment of clarity, <laughs> can you tell me what you feel like is like oh, the biggest so kind of. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to do a great job. I just I think that he is an artist that like gives no fucks. Mm. And I think that his music is unlike unlike uh anything else and i think that it's so i don't know i just think it's like unique in in a way that like really appeals to me and it's like okay that if you if it doesn't hit you you know i think it is like i i mean he's not an every man's man <laughs> like and that's okay uh uh i really i really like his music i think he's just like so inventive and, and unique and um the decisions that he makes are are, are bizarre and and appealing to me I so, but I don't. I don't feel like that sells anyone anything. But that's what you know. That's what I like. About. No, no. I feel like there, there's some songs on. There's like a, I don't know. Like there's some songs on House of Sugar that like sound like epic, like video game battle music. And mm. like I don't know. I also love that like his ability for from song to song to like go to a, like a totally different place. I mean, it's kind of just like you know, it's like he has that kind of like Daniel Johnston sort of quality. I think where it's like you know, he, some people like just don't get it and like some people are it's like profound and you know hmm. that divisiveness is also cool is uh you know that that ethos that you kind of brought up on the front end there of of not giving a fuck is that something that you strive for in in kind of your own way kind of your your own version of kind of not giving a fuck when you're creating and and deciding what to put out there totally i, I, I mean i don't like I don't I don't know if it's like necessarily a punk thing. Like, I think it's just like artistic integrity. Like, I think that um, I just think that the worst thing that you can do as a musician or as an artist is to pander. And like for, if you are so if you find like what makes you unique and you like lean so far in that direction to the point where like some things that like some people might find unlistenable, uh, like I think that's cool. Um and like what I'm interested in, even though it like breaks my heart, if not everyone loves what I do. Hmm. 
No, I, I think as a creator of any stripe, like the best thing that you can do, and, and when I get the most gratification out of what I do, it's it's when I'm disappointing people in a good way. It's when I'm, I don't know, in, in, in not trying to please people and not trying to tell people what they want to hear. And um, I guess reveling in the fact afterwards that uh, some of the reactions that I'm getting are, wow, I didn't know he'd say that. I, I, I'm pissed about it, but at least I didn't know he'd say it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that like that's what gets me going as an artist too. Is like doing the unexpected, and um, yeah, just like I don't know. I I think that the worst thing is just like you know staying in your lane and and doing what everyone wants because I think people hate that too. And at least if you're chasing what interests you, you have like the solace of having that. But if you like pander and everyone hates it anyway, you're like oh, I don't even, I don't even get the joy of liking what I made. I just was trying to please other people. And I think people can just smell it like a mile away uh, when you're trying to do it. They can. But honestly, it's there, there are a lot of people who are happy with that. For, yeah. You know, but I don't, I'm not interested in those people at all. Yeah. Um, I would be remiss if I did not uh, hit you up with a question that's maybe an obvious question. But I, I did get a lot of feedback here of people who are curious about um, the persimmons oh, okay. on, on, on the cover. Um, if, if there's any kind of a symbolism behind that or you know sort of like reason for their inclusion and there were a lot of people who are curious about the whereabouts of those specific persimmons in yeah. in, oh, in the picture yeah. like where that's you know where, where did they end up going what was their fate oh, yeah. you know it's oh that's a great question uh i love that <laughs> um, there were 400 persimmons at <laughs> Which is funny because like you don't see that many of them in the cover. I right. I actually like I don't like my like <laughs> I don't I don't like being on camera really. And even though like I I feel like this necessity to like be in my videos because I feel like more people will watch them and like you know even being on the cover like I wanted to be kind of far away like and so I wanted the main focus to be the persimmons and like be far away. So we had like four hundred persimmons. If you open the record, you can see more of them. But then th this photo ended up just being my favorite photo so I think it like kind of is fitting because uh I keep looking up because like I have all my records up there but um I I you know similar to like what I was thinking of sonically even visually I was thinking I think when you make a third record you start thinking a lot about your albums in context of one another and your discography so I was thinking like Psycho Pomp is this kind of like light blue melancholy like sky color and uh soft sounds is this very dark moody black and red and I the color yellow is obviously like so associated with joy and this like totally new like warm visual palette that seemed to like suit the sort of sonic direction that I was going in and then I saw an image of um so I knew I wanted it to be like really yellow like kind of warm tones and then I saw a photo of um these hanging persimmons which are a pretty popular fruit in East Asia and they'll hang them up to dry. And they basically are this like really bitter, hard fruit uh, that matures over time into something very sweet and palatable, like a sweet dried fruit. And I thought it was an apt metaphor for just my narrative as an artist, as someone who's like, you know, been sort of hardened by like a tough experience and is like kind of allowing its environment to sort of mature it into something sweeter. And I saw the photo and and like um I don't like yeah I'm like very sensitive about the way that I look and like I just love there's like kind of like a Mona Lisa type of like expression um in that photo and it's kind of fitting that I'm like very front and center because I think in a lot of ways I I I kind of vocally am very more front and center than my other records and uh yeah it just is, is fitting in that way oh but what happened to the persimmons so I I was worried about finding them and I think it was like I think we shot it in February and it was like kind of the like ending of the season and all of a sudden I, I had seen them all over the place and I was like we're set and then like the week that we were shooting I like they started disappearing I was like so freaked out <laughs> And then I went to Jmart in Flushing and I found a bunch of them. And I, I don't know why, but I was like suddenly in a panic that they would all go away. So I was like very like nervous about like blocking them and like putting them all onto the card. And like the guy was like, uh, I don't know, like really weirded out by like how I was buying all these persimmons. And then there, there used to be pre-pandemic. I was so excited. I moved into this place in Brooklyn. And there was a Korean like restaurant run by these like really cool like Korean young punks. Uh, and I was like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to like hang out at this Korean spot. I like just moved into this neighborhood. I hang out here all the time. And they're like really cool. I like went over to like one of their houses to like play Super Smash Brothers. And like uh, I like brought 
I brought a number of cases over to them to use at their restaurant. Uh, and then I gave some to my in-laws and they like baked like persimmon bread and did stuff. But I heard that a lot of them didn't get used, unfortunately, because they were like kind of mealy. Mm. <laughs> they were like not up to this restaurant standards. <laughs> well, geez, that, that was that that was Sorry, a whole, that, was that was a whole yeah. that was a whole adventure just over the persimmons. Um, <laughs> and and beautiful that they tie into the theme of the record and sort of the you know your progression to this point i'm also a big fan of the color yellow as people can uh, see my yellow backdrop actually blends in with your wall perfectly and um what you know, uh yeah I have, I have a yellow backdrop on the screen right now oh. and anytime that i'm wearing a yellow oh, flannel on the twitch? yeah Wait, on, on twitch backlighting me <laughs> yeah no okay. I'm, I'm not backlighting you it's it's okay. it, this it's it's just totally like you know it's 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 just coincidental um and then, you know, and anytime I'm wearing a yellow flannel, people know that's a, a you know, super positive review. So yeah, yeah, we're big fan oh, of yellow over here. Oh, whoa. Yeah. And um, do so. Do you do that? Yeah, I do that. I do that. Whoa. It's a, it's a part of the, that's another meme that we do over here. But whoa. um Wait, so like, you know, by the shirt color, like if you're going to pan something? Um, re, you know, like. Wait, what shirt are you wearing in my review? Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> anyway, another topic, another topic. Um, I love the idea of moving into the future that we're going to get. Are you looking it up? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I love the ideas we're moving into the future. We're going to get, we're, we're going to get the whole color spectrum from you, uh, hopefully. And, oh God. um, before we go, because we, we've taken up an hour of your time and we appreciate it. Uh, but as a fan of this gaming franchise myself as well, I have to ask you, uh, who, who is your smash main? Oh, uh, I'm like really basic. That's don't don't be. There's there's no wrong character. I can't especially play especially it. in I especially in ultimate. There's no wrong pick. Just, just I will tell say me. like I can't play. I like am a Kirby. I know it's basic as fuck. I like can't. I honestly like can't play. I'm not a good Smash player. I can only. But I the only way I can even like level the playing field a little bit is if I play. Kirby, because I'm not good at like doing the. I wish I was really good at the other characters. I mm -hmm. wish I was good at like. Um, there's so many other characters that I like, but I just can't play them very well. Hmm. No, I mean on on Smash 64, what I used to play. Yours? On Smash 64, I played nothing but Kirby. Right. Um, yeah. On the, on the newer iterations, I like to play Pac-Man, Pac-Man, <laughs> Mario. I know he's he, he's a really dumb another character. Circle. He's he's a really dumb kid. Yeah, another circle, and he throws melons too. So you know. oh my gosh! Yeah, he does. He does. So there there you go with that. Um, I really want to be good at like the really challenging characters that are really cute, but mm -hmm. they're so hard. Like Olimar. Like how the fuck do you play that character? Yeah, he's he's uh, those char like, those characters with a really weird quirky play animal style. Crossing, like villager. Like their moves are so fun, but I like can't navigate that character at all. The only like other character I can kind of play because it's basically like Kirby is is is. Meta Knight is kind of like that too, mm. and I basically just like drill into people. Yeah, there's there's some like uh, amazing players out there I've seen that can do like an Olimar, but I honestly I think your brain has to be broken to play that character well. Like you can you cannot see the game in the way that normal. It's people like being see. good at crane machines. It, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, being good at Olimar is like being good at crane machines. You're it's, like a huge reality to like to see what's going on. Yeah, exactly. It's such a weird, totally out there play style, uh, but a. Uh, uh, Look, uh, you've been an open book, and and that wasn't that's not a pun about you writing books. That uh, you know, I, I I say that when a guest is great, and I also don't know what uh, uh, to say about I don't know just the fact that I that we've been doing this for a year. You're easily our most well dressed guest that's ever been on. Oh, so th thank thank you for that as well. The, <laughs> the most well dressed and color coordinated with your area guest that we've had on. <laughs> And, uh, and, and yeah, this has just been hype. Everybody, uh, loved it in chat and we appreciate you coming through. Thank you so much, Michelle. Great. Right, thanks. Man. Thanks, yeah. Melon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have a good night. And we're, Bye. we're looking forward to the next record. Let us know when it comes out. Thank you. All right. Bye.